the west, Bethsaida in the east, 70% of the contact of the free synoptic gospels takes place on this, nine miles, which means Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Nazareth, Judean wilderness, all of the other location of the scripture, all of them combined are less than 30% of the content. This is where the ministry happens. The Sea of Galilee itself is 24 kilometers and 12 kilometers wide. I will need someone's help to say it in miles because I don't speak American that way. <laughs> um, the Sea of Galilee itself is actually profoundly small. And as you know, we live in the Middle East. It's a water rest area. The Sea of Galilee itself is actually not a sea. It is a lake. It's the lowest fresh water lake on the face of the planet. And my ancient forefathers, the authors of the Old Testament or Hebrew scriptures, are a desert dwelling people. As desert dwelling people, they have countless words for different types of desert in the original Hebrew, which is a matter of life and death for them. We, the speakers of modern 19th and 20th century and 21st century Hebrew, don't actually understand everything in the Biblical Hebrew. But offers of the Hebrew scriptures define every body of water as a sea. That's the terminology of the original Hebrew scripture. You can also see that when King Solomon builds his temple, they brought in there a br the Bronze Sea. But the Bronze Sea was about 50 feet worth of uh, water. But that is the linguistics of the time. Exactly like Eskimos have a ton of words for ice and snow, and we don't know and we don't care because we're not Eskimos. <laughs> the Sea of Galilee is referenced so in the Old Testament. The New Testament stems and just continues the terminology, and the word lake was only added to the Hebrew language, but Jews who came back from Russia in 1910 and they already knew what a lake was. An ancient Hebraic did not. Uh, I do believe the American measurements will be here as well. But as you can see, this is a tiny, tiny, tiny thing. The population of Galileans at the time was 5,000. The population, the global population of all the Galileans on the face of the planet living right now is 10,000. Guys, this is an amazing discovery. This is the single most important discovery so far in the 21st century. And this used to be a public beach. At the time, there would be 10 more worth of feet over the soil. 10 feet worth of soil was removed on many acres over there during the excavation. And the Roman Catholics wanted to build a hotel for Roman Catholic pilgrims. The government of Israel that had many, many public beaches did not uh, mind getting rid of one of them. They didn't, no one cares. They sold it off for a ridiculously low sum of money. And then the Roman Catholics are now required by law to procure a team of archaeologists. And these archaeologists will survey if there's anything valuable or not in the property which they just purchased. The head of said team of archaeologists is my old professor, wonderful, wonderful man called Najad Arfan, which is a Bedouin Muslim professor of archaeology, employed by the Jewish state on a Roman Catholic property. So if a rabbi and a priest ever walked into a bar, this is one of these cases. And Professor Najad Arfan discovers something that was amazing for us. And who is us? The nerds in the archaeology department of the Sea of Galilee College. 
And how do you preserve your fish fresh in a world that doesn't have ISO refrigeration? You cast your net to the side of the boat, and the fish are taken from the Sea of Galilee to the Sea of Galilee water, which is inside the boat. And then you sail the boat back to town, and you put your fish in a pre-made fish pond. Salt water. Salt thing comes later. And that's how you keep your fish fresh. And on this survey, Professor Arfan discovers the aqueduct system that fed these fish ponds with fresh water to keep the fish fresh. So in our school, and I'm a freshman of archaeology that year, we felt like we landed Apollo 11 on the moon. <laughs> because this was a piece of a puzzle that we have been pursuing for a very long time. So we're hugging and opening champagne bottles and floating <laughs> balloons in the air. And how does the world at large feel about all of this? No one could possibly care less. As the survey continues and Professor Arfan is about to sign the paperwork allowing the Roman Catholic Church to bring in bulldozers and do whatever they want, on the very last day of the survey, the synagogue of Magdala in the first century is discovered completely and utterly by accident. Which means this is one of the two buildings in creation we now know for sure Christ in his physical form would frequent. We have two buildings, we can say this on 100% certainly level. So you are looking at mosaic art, also some of the original paint job, and the, everything was brand new at the time, so they were protecting the findings from the building of the gazebo over the head. Guys, this small, small, small synagogue, first of all, it shows you how small the world of Jesus Christ really is. How everyone in the Galilee knows everyone by their first name. It was true then, and it's also true today. And you're looking at mosaic art, and in some of the original paint job that Jesus Christ saw with his own eyes when he was physically there. And the content of these parables, sermons, teachings that Jesus Christ delivers in this synagogue and other synagogues of the Galilee, after the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, the people of the Galilee who collectively rem remember all of this as oral traditions now say, hey, you remember that guy that always used to say that the temple will one day be destroyed? Now we should start taking this a lot more seriously and start writing down. And this is how Q was created. Guys, Completely and utterly by accident, one of the only buildings in creation, one of the two buildings in creation we know for sure Jesus Christ was in, was discovered. Inside the building is the only three-dimensional model of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem that was ever discovered. It's a one-of-a-kind, unique artifact. There's absolutely nothing like this anywhere in the world. The original sits in the lobby, which the Roman Catholics did, in fact, build their hotel. It only took them 10 years after their original schedule because of the findings. So, guys, one of the parishioners from the synagogue of Magdala went to the city of Jerusalem in one of the free pilgrimages. He was so impressed with what he saw over there that he came back to his own congregation, and he carved with his very limited artistic ability, this is not a professional artist, an image of the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, which he saw with his own eyes. Eventually, Magdala gets destroyed in 68 AD. The Holy Temple itself gets destroyed in 70 AD. 
And all of this is lost until some Roman Catholics put it in their mind to build a hotel on a public beach in 2009. So guys, the two pillars of the faith is an expression in the English language. And you can clearly see the two pillars in the front section of this three-dimensional model. Also, the city of Magdala got destroyed because all of the hotheads of the region, all of the confrontational, militant, nationalistic Jews, the loyalists of Judah Maccabee congregated in that town. Which means the loyalists of the house of Herod, the ones who were eager to cooperate and submit to the Romans, congregated in the city of Tiberias which is actually not mentioned in the scripture, virtually nowhere, and it's a very political thing. And the loyalists of the previous dynasty, the Maccabees, congregated in Magdala. You can clearly see the motif of a menorah and the two oil jugs, which means this patriotic Galilean in the first century has now tell, told us the story of how his country was created. Because the story of Hanukkah, which Jews celebrate until this very day, is the independence of the second Jewish kingdom. It means this guy just told us his 1776 or his 1948, 2000 years ago. The symbolism on the side of the model is a pomegranate, also affiliated with plenty and success and fertility and abundance for Jewish people. You can clearly see date palms on the side of the model. And you can also clearly see four horns representing the ever-present motif of four horns of a Hebrew altar. The rosetta on top as something that Jews or a symbol of Jews at the time will attribute to the highest ranks of clergy, which means this is another strong clue of what the artist is trying to tell us. Also, you can clearly see two date palms, which is always a symbol for Judea until this very day. Guys, what was the last name of this artist? I have absolutely no idea. <laughs> but I can 100% sure, sure tell you what the man's last name was not. And it wasn't Cohen. And one cannot be ordained a priest in the Jewish faith. One can study and be ordained a rabbi, a teacher of the scripture, but one cannot be ordained a priest. It doesn't exist for Jews. You're either born into a Kohen family, a priestly family. Kohen means priest in the Hebrew language, or you're not. If you're not a Kohen, if you are not a priest, you will never enter into the inner sanctum of the temple. Which means, up until this point, this anonymous artist described to us via his hands and his very limited artistic ability what he saw with his own eyes, and now everything becomes completely and utterly abstract. And this guy is using his limited artistic ability to relate to us what he heard. And he went to one of the priests, and he said to him, Mr. Cohen, I'm doing this nice project for my church back home. Please help me. Please describe to me what you feel when you're in there, where you feel. And Jews at the time genuinely believe that the Holy Spirit resides in the tabernacle. The Cohen probably read to him. We're not 100% sure if he read to him Elijah going up to heaven in the chariot of fire, but you clearly see two wheels of a chariot and what looks like a burning fire. It's also possible that Mr. Cohen read to him from Ezekiel about the chariot who was carrying the Spirit of God. When Jesus Christ died on the cross, the veil that was separating this tabernacle from the rest of the world was torn top to bottom in one shot. 
And it is now doctrine for every Christian and every Jew in the world that the Spirit of God does not reside in this temple, which no longer exists. It resides universally all over this planet. Some artwork from Magdala. I ask you to take a close look at the boat there on the left-hand side. The church over there also uses the boat symbol for their altar and preacher stand. It's a lovely, lovely church. And Christ many a times gave sermons from both sides. And they achieved, I feel, a beautiful optical illusion recreating that. This is a boat from the time of Jesus Christ. There is 99.99% probability Jesus Christ was physically on this boat. I, unfortunately, the Lord and Savior wasn't a vandalist, and he didn't carve his name <laughs> to the side of the boat. And, but that is truly the only thing we're missing to make this a 100% certain sure. And remember the iconography or the image of the boat in the artwork? Bam! Mid-1980s, two fishermen brothers whom I know quite well, Yuval and Moshe Lupin, all of the Galileans know each other. And these boys are fishermen for the adversary kibbutz to my kibbutz. It's like an old standing rivalry. And, and we are better than them in any way, shape, or form, farming, volleyball, etc. <laughs> they walk on the shore. Suddenly they see some old nails. And it's a Roman nail. It's the same type of technology which pierced the body of the Lord and Savior in Jerusalem. It's the same exact nail from the same exact time frame. They clear with their hands and they find a 12 meter or roughly 36 feet long fishing boat from the time of Jesus Christ. Science doesn't have an explanation as to why this boat didn't rot in the mud. Science doesn't understand how this happened. The method of how to get this ancient object out of the water had to be invented on the spot as no discovery of this kind was ever made. This was an unprecedented thing. American and Israeli archaeologists cooperated with this, and the boat was successfully rescued. And this is a diagram of what this boat is composed of. You can see predominantly and illustrated by orange is cedar, which is a very, very, very expensive tree. The owner of the boat, and this boat was in service for many, many decades, including the entirety of Jesus Christ's ministry to this region. The boat is physically there, 100% certain sure. The owner of the boat comes from the less affluent congregations. The boat is patched over and over again without any uniformity whatsoever with the building material that the owner could get his hands on in a given moment. After many, many, many decades of service, there are 12 types of wood in that boat. I think that's amazing. The nails over here are, the, this is one of the ways we learn what time it is because we understand the technological evolution of technology. This is the 100% time that we're looking for. Guys, what is this big object here in the center? Lunchbox. <laughs> this is a 2,000 year old lunchbox. And I myself am a former deckhand on the Sea of Galilee. You always know when you get on the boat, you never know when you get off the boat. So every kid brings his lunchbox with him. Today they're made out of plastic, but 2,000 years ago they're made out of clay. Left of that is a unique oil lamp, which is a 100% proof that the owner of this boat is a Shomer Shabbat, a Shabbat observant Jew. There are a few type of demographics who exist in the Sea of Galilee at this time frame. 
the people that are on the holy ark, that nine mile stretch of ministry, they will be the only demographic to comply with Shabbat law at this time frame. No one else on the Sea of Galilee will. So we now can prove without a shadow of a doubt that this boat originates out of the village of the Holy Ark. Chorazin is a non-Lakeshore community. They don't own boats. Bethsaida is the further eastern end, which leaves us with two candidates, Magdala and Capernaum. Magdala is an economically successful community. Capernaum is not. How many boats existed in Capernaum in the freer ministry, in the poor congregation? How many times is the boat motif in the scripture? The boat itself is discovered by Yuval and Moshe. Yuval and Moshe are the first generation of Galilean to be native to the Galilee. Their parents is the generation that ran away from Germany in the 30s and 40s. Which means the scripture teaches us that the first four disciples are fishermen brothers. You want to tell me that statistically this boat sinks, then sits there in the ground for two millennia. Science doesn't have an explanation as to why it's not rotten up. Then at the first opportunity that we have the type of demographic, right, of a native born Jewish Galilean fisherman after two millennia, it just pops out of the ground just like that. Like, what are the odds, mathematically? The so-called Mount of the Beatitudes, it's been the Mount of the Beatitudes since 1928 when Benito Mussolini, the Italian fascist dictator, decided this is the Mount of the Beatitudes. Scriptorically and archaeologically, I beg to differ. Those of you who will wish to come to the Galilee, I will make this very, very, very clear. I do like going there because the view is fantastic. <laughs> and the garden is nice. But we are looking at Capernaum as seen from the top of the mountain of Beatitudes. The fourth century church, which is usually a hint to where things were, in a more reliable and close to the event horizon, claims it's much lower. Also, I fail to see why the Lord and Savior will bring 5,000 people from the shoreline all the way up the mountain, teach them up there, and then go down to miraculously feed them. My drill sarge would most certainly have, but he was no Messiah, I can tell you that. <laughs> so this is the east side of the land of the gospel. Why does Christ choose Capernaum from all places? The river Jordan runs between Capernaum and Bethsaida. The River Jordan is also the county line in the first century between the patriarchy of one Herod Antipas of Tiberius and one Herod Philip of Caesarea Philippi. That's a state line. At this point, the feds, which are the Roman Empire, are not interested in Christ. They don't care about him. But when Christ says, the fox has his hole in the ground. He is most certainly referring to Herod Antipas of Tiberius, which has already beheaded his cousin. And the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Which means whenever he's in trouble with the ruler of Tiberius and he just hops over to the next village, he's in a different county. Herod Antipas has no jurisdiction here. And this is a very convenient thing for him to choose Capernaum as his HQ or center of operations. This is quite cool. This is my own archaeological project. I have been excavating here for 15 years. It appears in the Bible on many occasions. Cameron, you have actually read this to us this morning. The city on top of the hill, which cannot be hidden, in the first century, the whole city is plastered in white, which means when Jesus Christ is talking and teaching, he's talking Galilean because he knows exactly who it is he's talking to. The city is in the very east side of the Sea of Galilee, and the disciples and the villages of the Galileans are on the northern and western side, which means in their little world of the time, every single night the sun sets in the west, 
reflecting very powerfully from a city on top of a mountain, which the city walls are plaster white, which means it's illuminating by a setting sun on their little world for every day of their entire lives. Those of you who wish to join the excavation, please write HIPAS Excavation Project, and it's a joint Israeli-American effort, and we will love to have you, especially if you're into waking up at 5 a.m. and sweating in the sun in 120 <laughs> degrees. But then we will love to have you even more. <laughs> the land of the gospel as seen from the west side, and we can see the very dramatic cliff of our bell, and look at Tiberius, which doesn't appear anywhere in the scripture. Massive mystery, and unfortunately we don't have the time frame to unwrap it right now. The church of Tabha, and there's another massive mystery over here. And you can see that this is a 4th century post-Constantine mosaic art. None of the artwork whatsoever reflects the story of the feeding of the multitude. All of the artwork, with no exception, reflects scenery from the river Nile in Egypt. Please, we will continue this conversation in the Galilee itself, another massive, massive mystery. The tradition, though, states, and this is the only reference to the feeding of the multitude, and you can see the artwork referencing the two little fishes and five loaves of bread. The two pillars of a Christian pilgrimage to the Holy Land, Capernaum and Calvary. Those are the two most important things. Capernaum is a trailer park, as was Nazareth. I don't have much to work with because trailer parks don't preserve well over extended periods of time. That's just the way it is. But you can see the black basalt rock. And please remind me your name, sir. Uh, Don. Don, who is an expert on basalt. Um, and also my cousin, because archaeologists and geologists are cousins to one another. Uh, but my friends, please look at the basalt, which is the native stone to this part of the world, which means whoever created this village didn't import any building material from anywhere else. Who conducts themselves that way? The poor and the very poor alike. Also, look at the level of stonemasonry and craftsmanship over here. Virtually non-existent. Capernaum neighborhood B, which is the same technology, same building material as Capernaum neighborhood A. The only difference is look at the grinding apparatus, which are here in abundance. And this is a one-man show. It's one guy turning this thing all day. He manufactures very little. And at this time, a much larger industrial beast of burden technology will exist in the world, but the people of Capernaum don't own any of that which confirms to us extremely well the reality of Capernaum we are expecting from the scripture. And suddenly there's this big white building. The big white building is manufactured from a completely different type of stone, lime, which means it came in from somewhere else. Also look at the level of craftsmanship and you can see first century Capernaum, the basil zone, and you can see the very poor level of craftsmanship. And suddenly, you can see the beautiful, beautiful decorations, and you can also see the Corinthic order capitals. You can also see what we call a Corinthic order heart-shaped capital at the corner over there. Who builds so well and so grand? Romans. There is no other candidate. That's, that's their fingerprint right there. A blast from the past. And I can read Aramaic, although I don't always understand what it is I read, but Hebrew and Aramaic, which are sister languages, share the same alphabet. In this case, I can read it. Bal HaZabadai, the sons of Zabadai. 
Remember well the house of Zebedai when you sit and eat your bread. This was a blast from the past. Someone from the house of Zebedai was a vandalist, and he graffitied the last name Zebedai centuries after the events of Scripture. It means John and James, the sons of Zebedai, became disciples and left. Other members of this family just continued their normal life. They went into the sea, they fished, they came back, they had kids, they circumcised and bar mitzvah these kids who got married and had kids, and their Zebedee boys continued to exist in Capernaum for centuries after the scriptorial events. The so-called synagogue of Capernaum it is actually a late Roman pilgrimage attraction. And at this point, we can archaeologically prove that. For instance, every Jewish synagogue ever built in the history of human race always have a niche where the ark containing the Torah is facing Jerusalem. Someone wanted to build a building that kind of looks like a synagogue, but this person who built it isn't Jewish. So there's tiny, tiny, tiny little nuances that they missed and overlooked. Someone else who is Jewish, someone else who is from this village, after the crucifixion, is putting, pulling their resources together, effectively creating a Jewish kibbutz in Capernaum in the first century, I firmly believe this is a direct result of the trauma of the crucifixion. And we can read about it in the last paragraph of both Acts 2 and Acts 4, Way of Life of the Believers. Which means local families, not the federal budget from Rome that built that big white fancy building, with level of technology and resources that befit the biblical description are picking out one first century house that will be indistinguishable to anyone which is not an insider on this community. It will just look the same. And they're turning it into what we call a domus ecclesia or domestic church, a house converted into a church. These guys are using what very little resources they have, which means they care about this a great deal to distinguish from the Romans that are using a federal budget, which leads us to very firmly believe this is the other building in creation that we can say for 100% sure the Lord and Savior was physically in. Both of these buildings are in the Galilee. A tributary that I pulled out from the archives of my own congregation in Galilee, and this is the Vid Ben Gurion paying his respects to Jesus Christ in Capernaum. Guys, some other items, and we have identified now, Professor Mordechai Alviam was able to identify Bethsaida. This is from one of the failed attempts. This is Bethsaida, but this is Old Testament or Iron Age Bethsaida. And who is this image right over there? Baal. This is a monument to the Canaanite rain god, Baal. An original article. This is Old Testament, come to life. And still in Bethsaida, and someone also carves the image of a bull. Why did my ancient forefathers worship a golden calf in the Sinai Desert? They were very poor. They were slaves in Egypt, and they didn't muster enough gold to manufacture a golden bull. So. That's what they really wanted to do, and they had to settle for a golden calf. <laughs> um, my kibbutz, Kibbutz Ein Gev, is currently the largest commercial fishing company to exist on the Sea of Galilee. And we are also very happy to have anyone who wishes to come and hang out with us and be a fisherman on the Sea of Galilee for one day. Please, by all means, we are happy to have you. Of course, we do it in a very modern way. People that want to do it in a more traditional way, we can also make that happen as well. Everything the Western world knows about Galilean fishing in the time of Jesus Christ is a product of my congregation coming into existence. 
because our founding fathers were so poor, running away from Germany in the 1930s, they had to reverse engineer biblical fishing in order to survive. And as you can see, the tilapia, the same fish that Christ and his disciples were after, is what we are after in this day and age. Also nicknamed St. Peter's fish. This is my good friend Alon, and a genuine 100% Galilean fisherman, very much alive in our day and age. And Mr. Menachem over here, he's a bit of a difficult man, but he has been a fisherman in the Galilee for 40 consecutive years. This gentleman is the closest thing to St. Peter alive today. <laughs> but I also assure you, St. Peter himself was a tough person, okay? You, you gotta be tough to do this job for so long. The River Jordan, and in this case, this is not where Jesus Christ was baptized by John the Baptist. That is way down in the desert, a, a little north of Jericho. In 2000, we had a lot of security issues, and the original and more authentic place was too dangerous. So the local kibbutz over there opened a fabricated place, but it looks so much better than the original place, and it's closer to the Sea of Galilee, so I added it to this slideshow, because I don't know if you can tell I'm quite a Galilean patriot. <laughs> My dear friends, I invite you, whenever it is reasonable and feasible for you, to make your life as a Christian richer and to make the pilgrimage to the Holy Land and it is my dream that every Christian will visit the place where the Christian faith was born at least one time in his lifetime. Thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Just hit the top button here. There we go. I got it. Perfect. Thank you. Awesome. Well, thank you, Idan. Thank you so much. And, you know, one of the things that Idan and I have been dreaming up um, since he arrived, well, since before he arrived, because we had wanted to make this trip happen last year. <laughs> and so, as he was saying at the beginning of his talk, um, is we would love to make this a reality for us and to plan a trip uh, for St. Richard's folks to go and see these places. I mean, the last uh, few weeks, you know, the gospel reading has, um, we've, we've heard the calling of the, the disciples just recently. Um, and uh, seeing these pictures helps me envision it in a totally different way, right? It helps the scriptures come alive in a way um, that I don't think you can really replicate without physically being there. And so we would love to make this trip a reality, and we're going to work on that, and um, more to come, more to come on that. Um, but I just am so grateful for Idan being here today. Thank you all for being here this morning. Uh, and I hope that was a teaser enough to entice you to come back at 6 uh, as we'll explore the old city of Jerusalem uh, in that talk and also have some more time because we've got to go to church. Uh, but tonight we'll have more time at the end uh, for Idan to take questions and, and to discuss. Uh, but we do have just a couple of minutes if anybody has a question about what you just heard. Yes, Ruthie. I worked for my congregation. My congregation owns five big worship boats. My boats that I worked with are very, very, very big and have very powerful engines. So I myself was never afraid. <laughs> yes, there are small ones, yes. But I've never been out there in rough waters. <laughs> yeah. Ah, wonderful. Mm -hmm. and I'm not really a <laughs> <No>. <laughs> if the sea looks quiet, it's going to be fun, and it's going to be really, really relaxing, and these things go very, very slow, and you're like in a very mild pace, 
you know, and you turn off the engine, and you remember how Jesus Christ did the same thing on a small boat with no engine. So if the sea looks quiet, go right ahead and do it. And if the sea don't look quiet, then please don't. It's good practical advice there, Don. <laughs> yes. What do you mean we accept them? Is our rulers? Um, it's a very good question. And your name, sir? My name is John. John. Some of the Jews, and this is not true only to Judea. It's true to every place that the Romans colonized. Some of the indigenous population developed a pro-Roman attitude. The Romans installed a puppet king called King Herod the Great, who was so smart and so conniving, he wasn't a puppet at all. Um, his sons, Herod, Herod, and Herod, and if you think George Foreman invented anything, then apparently he did not. <laughs> but, um, but his sons were not effective, which means they are genuine puppets. And it means that I would assume at their time, in the time of the ministry, the vast majority of the Jews had strong anti-Roman sentiments, and a small minority of very elitist Jews had pro-Roman sentiments. And one of the reasons that the first coming didn't work out that well is the vast majority of the Jewish people really wanted the Messiah to be the continuation of the legacy of King David and a more of a warrior king rather than the Prince of Peace. And I think that reflects, I, be, I hope, the political attitude that did exact, exactly I want a biblical description. I also want extra biblical references. I want to cross-reference the Bible with material evidence being archaeological findings. And I want whatever point of view I can, which is outside of the Bible. When I get all of these things, now I'm in business. So I have Josephus, Flavius, the historian. I have plenty of archaeological findings. We, I believe we have a proof. But please remember that when Christ enters on Palm Sunday, he is hailed as King of Messiah by the vast majority of the Jews. But that is not a democratic society. No one cares what the public thinks. Awesome. We have time for probably one more before we... Anybody? going once. Awesome. Well, again, thank you all so much. Thank you, Idan, uh, for sharing that with us, and I look forward to welcoming you back at six uh, for more. So thank you all. Go in peace.